We're in the business of delivering impossible things. We're in the business of delivering things that nobody's ever seen before. If you build that culture, you'll come up with you know really cool and innovative stuff, and you know, literally could be in the next multi-billion dollar idea. So this conversation is largely going to be about scaling yourself and scaling your leadership team. I want to talk about one of the biggest struggles that I think a lot of startups face early on, which is building initial traction. All right. Hello, world. If we haven't met yet, I'm Jason Goldless. I'm the co-founder of TechTO. Welcome back to TechTO Together. We've got a great lineup for you tonight. First, we have the CEO of Docsend, Russ Heddleston, joining us for a fireside chat. He's going to be talking about his work with Docsend and sharing some insights from their research on the state of fundraising in 2021. Then we're welcoming Rewind CEO Mike Potter to the stage for a founder spotlight chat. They just raised a Series A of $19 million. Congratulations to Mike and the Rewind team. We'll hear all about it later tonight. And after that, it's time for breakout sessions. We have three amazing sessions happening tonight. We've got the University of Toronto Arts and Science Co-op program here. This is one of the most exciting times of the year for hiring co-op students. We're going to hear from Pana later on tonight to tell us more about it. Our friend and TechTO insider, John Blake Nectel, is here to help you with your fundraising questions. He just helped a startup in the UK close a very fresh round of financing, and he's here to share the story of how they did it and how you can too and answer your questions. And you loved it so much in December, we've brought it back for round two. It's the Content Marketing Garage. It's here with Quinn and Liz. They'll be hitting all the hottest marketing topics, tips, and tactics. I hear there will even be a special Elon cameo. Probably not Elon himself, but at least the topic is going to come up. You've got to be inside the venue if you want to join those breakout sessions. So if you are watching us on LinkedIn or Facebook or anywhere across the web, head on over to techto.org, grab a ticket on our live streams, and come join us on the inside. And lastly, we're going to be ending off the show with my favorite part of the evening. It's some FaceTime with each other. Face time. You'll have the chance to meet other community members just like you one-on-one -on -one, to explore how we can help each other win together this year. You got to be on the inside. So come on in to techto.org. There's lots to look forward to tonight, but the most important thing to remember is that we're not here just to listen and not just to learn, but also to have some fun. This is a great opportunity to flex those social muscles that have been dormant during quarantine. And here's how you can take part in tonight's live stream. If you are inside the venue with TechTO, make sure your profile is up to date. In the top corner over here, you can actually add a photo if you don't have one already, and your name, and a headline, and connect your LinkedIn profile. And then don't be shy to explore the audience. They're, they're all down here. Hey, everybody, how y'all doing? You can check them out, see what they're up to, add them on LinkedIn, and maybe include a short note that you found them at TechTO. Hey, and if you look over here, Hey, you can see the emoji cannon. Click any of your favorite emojis and fire one across the screen, just like that for everyone. Let's give it a try now. Come on. Whoa, whoa. Hey, there they go. Pretty awesome. Some of my favorite emojis flying there. And of course, we've got our community chat. I see many of you have already introduced yourselves. And if you haven't, do it now. Let us know where in the world you're joining us from. I am joining you tonight from beautiful Port Carling and Muskoka, Ontario. All right. Tonight is made possible by our amazing sponsors. We've got RBC, Shopify, the City of Toronto, TELUS Business, University of Toronto Arts and Science Co-op Program, Rideout and Maybe, and Bright Immigration. They all help us grow together because that's what TechTO is all about. We're so much more than just Tech Toronto. This is Tech Together. And today is the start of Black History Month all across Canada. Over the course of this month, we're going to be highlighting the work of Black founders in our community and some amazing organizations that are working to support them. This year, we've launched a program supported by RBC Future Launch. It's called TechTO for Emerging Leaders. It's a fully online program that provides underserved youth, age 15 to 29, access to skill development, knowledge, advice, and networks to help them thrive in tech. We want the next generation of tech leaders to be the most diverse, educated, and exciting generation yet. And we know that when we're all on board and working together, we can make this happen. So we're dropping a chat, a link in the chat right now where you can learn more about the program and how to nominate yourself, your community organization, or your company to take part. Now, let's get the show started. Alex Norman is here to host tonight's Fireside Conversations. Hey, Alex, what's up, man? Hey, Jason. I'm just uh, 
closing up my position GameStop right now. So give me a second. <laughs> so uh, yeah, good luck uh, if you're doing that on Robinhood. Of course, if you're on Well Simple Trade, no problems at all. We'll close that out for you. But before we get started, it's time to play my favorite game. Are you ready? It's yeah. called Wheel of Norman. Bring up the wheel. Okay, get get that arm ready, Alex. Get you know, arm ready I think someone's spin. rolling it into poor credit right now. You have to go to some time. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, are you ready? Give it a big spin. There you go. Let's see what we get. It's mine okay. This is the um, ad supported version today. I bet you the next one will be uh, will be free. Let's see what we got here. The wheel is ending on your prediction for how the Canadian tech community will evolve over the next five years. Oof, you gotta make a five-year prediction right now. You couldn't even make a five-day prediction on GameStop. You know, I think, I think I'm think i gonna do just generic. It's gonna be bigger, it's gonna be more inclusive, it's gonna be more, um, you know, it, it's gonna be bigger, but it's not gonna be the Valley. It's gonna be focused on making a change in a Canadian way. So that means we'll be very big, we'll be very quiet about it, will be very inclusive and we'll try to take everyone along. It's going to be a bit more socialist. I hate to say that word, but you know, <laughs> that means we'll make sure that the, the wealth is, is shared widely. You know, unfortunately, that's why Elon Musk is no longer here. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, I'll take it. Uh, pretty good. You know what? We'll do another spin of the wheel uh, after your conversation with Russ. How's that sound? Sounds perfect. Thanks, Jason. So now I'd like to get to uh, the first fireside of the night. I'd like Russ Heddleston, the CEO of Docsend, to join me on stage. Um, we're going to go through, over the next few minutes, we're going to go through Russ's background. We're going to go through the starting and what Docs is, some of the challenges Docsend or opportunities Docsend has uh, gone through. We're going to talk about some of the things he may know about fundraising. I think a few people use Docsend. And then we're going to do a lighting round. Um, so Russ, please join me on stage. Hey, Alex. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for making the time. I, you know, I heard that you were in Lake Tahoe. So if I was in Tahoe, I'd be out skiing right now. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could be out skiing. I'll do it tomorrow, though. I'm very excited to be here. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, so, you know, it's going to do a big introduction of you. But I said, let's instead of me just introducing your background, let's talk about it. So let's go way back to start. Like, I heard that you were an army kid and you moved around a lot uh, when you were younger. <laughs> you're going uh, way back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're going to go back, you might as well go back. Uh, so how did, that, how did that impact your perspective on life? And, you know, because I think you didn't grow up in the Valley, you moved to the Valley. So what's it like um, to see a bit of the world before the Valley and then eventually end up there? Well, yeah. So I was actually born in San Francisco, but we lived here for two months <laughs> at, on the army base uh, before it got shut down. And then we moved to Berlin, Germany for five years. So I got uh, a lot of early memories of just running and chasing pigeons along the Berlin Wall. And then we were in Denver for five years. And then my uh, dad got out of the military and we moved to South Dakota, which I think we the U.S. should give to Canada, but I don't think Canada wants it. So it's really <laughs> an odd in-between zone <laughs> in the Dakotas. But um, yeah, I just kind of Grew up like very yeah, not in the valley. I didn't have an email address before um, getting uh, going to Stanford. I got really lucky getting in there. Um, I, I just showed up totally unprepared. <laughs> so, so tell, I, us, tell us about it. You went to Stanford. You, you know, and what, was it what you expected? Um, I had no idea what to expect. No, I, when I went to visit, I got a water polo t-shirt because I thought it was really funny because I didn't know water polo was a sport. I thought it was like horses in the pool or something. Like, I was <laughs> really, uh, really clueless. Uh, and I just remember like one of my first math exams just getting destroyed. Everyone else had already taken the class in prep school and here I am from like a public school in South Dakota. So I, I felt like I was trying to catch up immediately upon getting there. Uh, it, it's so I had a, a chip on my shoulder. I mean, certainly going through it, just trying to to keep up. And it took me a couple of years at first to try to get up to speed, but I, I started to really like find the stuff I was really excited about, which ended up being engineering. Uh, started off building robots. Um, one of my uncles had a good advice, was like, study the hardest thing you can, because you're not gonna do that later. I was like, hmm, makes sense. And then I ended up falling in love with the, the software side of it more than the hardware side. So I stuck around and did a master's in computer science, which my parents called my delayed decision program, um, <laughs> putting up the real world for another year. but. Even in undergrad, there are so many cool companies at Stanford um, that I got to be one of the first interns at Trulia when there are four people there. It's intern at Microsoft for a summer, um, a couple other places, but it, it was just really fun. And I, I really started to like the startup scene while I was there. Um, yeah, it's just a great place to get into it. Yeah, it sounds like you adapted to the you know Silicon Valley culture quite quickly. Started, found out hardware's hard, went to software, and then 
you went to work for a startup right after school, right? You worked at Graystripe. Um, yeah. yeah. So that was one of my, my mentors, um, did their funded their series a, uh, Fern Mendelbaum. And, um, and so there were seven people there at the time. And, uh, so I had just done all this coding, but I, I wanted to go learn the business side. So I, I actually started off in, um, business development there. And then through a series of unlikely events ended up running the engineering team. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to one of those battlefield promotions. Um, but that was a really great experience. I was there, uh, just for, I think it was a little over three years, um, and grew the company a lot. And then, uh, I left for business school, but they ultimately sold to, uh, another company in the ad tech world. And we were, we were doing uh, mobile ads. So I like to say gray stripe was like the number two ad mob. And there was just a big difference between number one and number two. <laughs> I'm very familiar with that, Bob. Um, so I want to just pick apart one thing I heard there. You said that a mentor helped you find that position. So talk a bit about mentorship and how it actually, because imagine Stanford, you can go to hundreds of startups, you, you know, you have your choice. So how did that play a role and, and how important have mentors been in your career? They, over the years, have been really influential. Uh, and I think part of it is, and coming from South Dakota, like I just always assume I don't have the answers and I need to get help. So uh, you know, it's, like, yeah. it's just really nice that people are willing to spend time with me or give me advice on stuff. Um, but I think I had offers from like uh, Microsoft and I even I had an offer from McKinsey. I thought I might want to be a management consultant. And then, and, uh, yeah, I then I went to, Jason and I met at McKinsey. Uh -huh. See what it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, it would have been fine. But I, I just realized that what I liked the most was like just building stuff. And, and so this particular mentor um, kind of helped me like through that decision process. And so that's why I ended up joining this uh, Gray Stripe. I think one thing that's funny about being in Silicon Valley or going to Stanford, the only thing you're guaranteed is that you're gonna miss out on many billion dollar companies because you know they're, they're all around <laughs> or at least it seems that way. <laughs> so so you, did you intern at Trulia, are you upset you didn't go back? Um, no, I've kept in touch with Pete and Sami and people there. Um, no, and I, and I think working in tech long enough, you just have to recognize that, that you have to be smart and work hard, but there's totally an element of luck that is just, you can't beat yourself up over it, cool. <laughs> you know? Uh, so I, I just I just am very excited when, when friends have big successes uh, or big outcomes, you know, it's like, a, I, I don't ask myself the question like, oh my God, should I have done that? Should I have gone there? Cause it's, it's not productive. I think I had an offer from YouTube before they uh, <laughs> sold, so. Yeah, um, I, so yeah. Let, let's go back to Graystripe. So it, you were there three years. It looks like you it scaled a bit and eventually sold. So two questions about that. One, what was the biggest takeaway from that experience that you applied to DocSend today? Oh, um, there, were, there were just so many learnings. Um, so I ended up uh, recruiting my two co-founders at Docs and Dave and Tony. So we all worked at Graystripe together. Um, they they had some people issues on the team that made me kind of recognize the importance of culture or getting ahead of problems. And the company ended up being doing fine, uh, but but there were a lot of like lessons on the soft side of things. It was the first time I ever had to fire someone, um, and that was hard. Recruiting's hard. Um, building, scaling this product hard. We had to pivot and thank God we did. Uh, so even even like assessing your own business and understanding like when to pivot, when not to pivot. Um, you know, I, I wasn't in charge of it. That was the CEO, but I mean, I was certainly happy that we did. We pivoted from being on like Java games to being uh, iPhone. And so like that was that was good timing <laughs> to get yeah. on them as an iPhone SDK at the time. And then you went to HPS, which we can get, we, that could be a whole conversation on its own, especially with how the <laughs> Valley views at MBAs. Um, but while you were there, you started another, you started a company called Pursuit and I've seen you refer to it as both a success and failure. So why do you view it as both? It depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> okay. If I'm being honest, I think it's a failure, but I mean, I wouldn't even say that it, we, we didn't do what we set out to do. We, we wanted to build a company. Um, I, I think we were smart in, in how we did it, but it was me, two other, um, friends who are engineers as well, who I met at Trulia, um, and still keep in touch with them. Uh, I mean, that's another good lesson that I was like, how do you find a technical co-founder? I'm always like, oh, that's tough. Like just, if you go work somewhere, just like make sure you keep friends on the engineering team and figure out who you like and then life life happens and then just happens to be who's available, you know, at that, at that particular point in time. So there's the three of us and we wanted to build this HR tech. Um, and we had a bunch of ideas. We're like, okay, we're just gonna spend a little bit of time in this first one. And, you know, fast forward a year, 
Uh, it was also really hard to fundraise. I mean, that was another thing I learned both from Gray Stripe and Pursuit was just like, don't take fundraising for granted. It's hard. Like when times are good, everyone will give it to you. And when times are bad, they won't. And that's when you need it. Um, but so we raised like a 500K round for Pursuit. And about a year in, um, we just looked at the numbers and we had like 50, 60 companies signed up, a few thousand users. And it just didn't, it wasn't working like we thought it would work. Um, so we, you know, we're like, okay, I guess one year in, that took a long time to get to that first idea on the list. Yeah. And then we messaged everyone that we were going to shut it down and try something else. And then um, Facebook approached us. And so we ended up interviewing at Facebook and LinkedIn and went to Facebook. So that's why I can say it was a success. Uh, we didn't actually spend any of that investor money. So we, you know, investors got their money back. Um, we got, you know, a soft landing. Um, and my rationale to my co-founders like, hey, we can just go work at Facebook for a year. And that's probably like our seed round of funding if we want to go try a number two on the list, you know? Um, so, and, and it is actually hard to get talent acquired. Like, you know, and I, I oh, that's another thing. I had an offer from Facebook from undergrad. So <laughs> speaking of other things <laughs> to miss out on. Uh, that, that, when I was my master's, Facebook was emerging and one of my friends was using it to find dates. And I'm like, I can't, that seems like a dodgy site. I'm not going to spend time on it or get involved with it. <laughs> that was 2005. So, uh, um, and Jason knows who I'm probably knows who I'm talking about. And so you went to Facebook, you went to Facebook for what, two, three years. It's just a little under two, under two years. Yeah. And how did that impact, you know, so now you've seen one company exit, you got your, you got your MBA, you had your first company. Now you're, looking at Docsend. So how did that impact your approach to founding Docsend and knowing that was the right company to pursue? Um, so, I mean, I, I knew that I was leaving a bunch of money on the table by leaving Facebook early, but again, you know, having the mindset of like, you know, do what you're excited about and it'll probably work out in the end. Um, Dave and Tony, who, you know, we all went to undergrad together. We've known each other since 2003. Um, they went with the acquisition so I left for business school, they stayed on, it got acquired, okay. and then they were ready to leave. And so I just wanted to start something with them. And so I left, because it's like, again, like a window, you, people you wanna work with again. So I left, um, and we again, came up with a list of ideas. I, some entrepreneurs I talked to, they're like, at the age of three, I knew I wanted to start this thing. And I'm always like, that's awesome. I, at the age of three, I, I was just, running around Berlin, I had no idea about <laughs> tech or anything. So yeah, we again had a list of ideas, and this time we didn't write any code for, for like the first four months. We just went off and like interviewed people. Like we're just really scrappy. So like Tony was interested, he loves cars. And so we were like, oh, maybe we can do something selling to car dealerships. And so we talked to a couple of car dealerships and we're like, nope, that is right out. I do not want to spend years selling to car dealerships or building software for them. Um, and so I always say you can often prove an idea is a bad idea in a relatively short period of time but you can't prove a good idea is a good idea. You just kind of ah. fail to prove it's a bad idea. So with Docsend, I mean, the initial concept was like, why are people still sending attachments? I also interned at Dropbox in 2010 while I was in business school and we came up with the link sending model. And Tony had also worked on a document technology company that had sold um, in Creo, they had sold to Box. Um, and so I was just wondering like, why are people still sending attachments? It's just like mm -hmm. weird. So we just did enough interviews where we were like, someone should just build this tech that, and we just have to add enough value to the sender and make it easy for the recipient. And we also went around, one of the things I learned at Facebook is that big companies are like just doing whatever they're doing. They're not gonna like pivot for your tiny yeah. idea. It's on a spreadsheet somewhere, but you have more to gain than you have to lose as the entrepreneur. Because while I was at Facebook, entrepreneurs would come to me and be like, hey, I'm working on this thing, but I don't really wanna tell you what it is because you're gonna steal my idea. And I'm like, listen, like I'd be horrible at my job if I'm like, all right, everyone, Everyone, we're pivoting. We're pivoting to do this thing because someone had an idea. <laughs> it's like they have more to gain to know. Like, is it on our list? Why? Why not? Like, when? You know, it's to their benefit if we're actually building it right now and launching in a few months. That's good for them to know. Um, so anyway, I went around to all the big companies that I thought should build Docs, and and we got a couple talent acquisition offers. But I was like, I just went through that, um, and they would have had us work on something else. And they said they were going to get to it in a couple of years. And by the way, a couple of years in like product management land means never. <laughs> Anything that's like a couple of years out at a big company, it's just never going to happen. Yeah. So, so yeah, like, so for, right. cool. And and just two things. Um, one for an audience, ask questions. I'll weave them in because I don't see any coming in. I'd love to see questions. And then just let's take a step back for people that somehow don't know what Docs is. I think it's probably something I use all the time or see used all the time. What is Docs? How do you describe it to people now? Um, I mean. 
Hmm. It, I mean, the elevator pitch depends, but if you're like fundraising, it's like, hey, it's a really nice way of sending 10 different people a unique link to your deck and you can see how long they read each page and who they forward it to. And so if you need to update it, you can see which version they've looked at. So you know if you need to tell them or not, and then you can turn off the links independently. Recipients never need a login, but you as the sender can lock it down to the level of control that you want with like dynamic watermarking uh, or authenticating their email. And then we have a whole data room product that's also pretty flexible. So that gets used, you know, as a data room, obviously, but also as an investor portal. Like a lot of our biggest customers are sales teams where they often don't have security, but that an the analytics are really important. The aggregate stats, being able to have a deal room, being able to like learn from other salespeople. Um, so yeah, we've got about 17,000 customers now uh, for the for the product. Um, but again, you know, like a salesperson will talk about it a little bit differently than a CFO, than a founder. So we've really built a horizontal technology that we market vertically and talk about by use case. Um, but yeah, I still think it's just a really easy way to like send documents and see if people are reading them and make sure they don't get beyond the intended audience. Well, I want to get back to that horizontal versus vertical in a minute, but I also still want to go back to the founding. So I love the like honest transparency because every founder today seems to say, oh yeah, I've started thought of this company 10 years ago and the why now? But what I heard was the, be the why now really was you had an opportunity to work with two people you really liked. You had a bunch of ideas that you did customer development. And I, I want to go back to that idea that you did customer development. You killed what didn't work, but you can't be sure what works. And why, why, why do you believe that? Well, you just, in a given period of time, fail to like prove it's a bad idea. Like the other ideas that we got to, like, I'm like, I'm pretty sure this isn't going to work. We did think about building a review site, which would have been G2 crowd. Um, and so that was like a valid category. Um, but the, the Doxin concept, we were just more excited about that one. Um, and so we did all these interviews, we like transcribed them, we found common threads in them. And you know, like our seed pitch deck from 2013 is the product we've built today, <laughs> you know? So uh, we, we weren't wrong, there, there could have been more, there, and there was a lot of competitive pressure. We've had a lot of big companies pop up in the meantime. Um, but, but yeah, like we just kept going uh, with it. And, at a certain point, you just have to decide. We had to like break ground and start coding, you know? <laughs> yeah. And then did you, you know, I, I think out somewhere else floating out there is I think it's your seed or A round deck. And I see market sizing. But did you, like, was that a market sizing just for there? Did you worry about the size of the market when you started? No. I think it's pretty obvious when the market size is too small. When I talk to entrepreneurs, this, this is like pretty big. Like Google or Microsoft should have built, built Docsend. And I'm, They'll, they'll need to at some point, um, uh, some, some version of it is just smart. It's so easy, to mo so easily monetizable and differentiated. Um, but no, we didn't, we didn't think about market size and investors often discount that too. There's kind of a gut reaction to it. So like Jeff from Uncork who did our seed round, he looked at it. He's like, I'd, I'd use this. And then he was like, this reminds me of SendGrid. SendGrid at the time was in a crowded space, but they had a good product. And I thought maybe there's something there. Maybe maybe not everything has been done in the world of email sending. And obviously that was a great outcome for him. So he didn't that's he didn't really dive into the details of how big exactly is is this market. It's like it's it's big enough. Cool. I, I'm, I love that it's big enough, and I think the the gut check is there. Uh, would like to go more into funding and what you know about funding. But before that, I want to go back apart. You're a horizontal product with vertical markets, um, and because I guess most people on this this uh, live stream probably think of you as the company we send out our decks in, right? How we protect our decks. Yeah. So tell us a bit more about how do you pursue both being horizontal, but vertical specific, you know, I, I read some stuff about sales versus marketing. And how, so I guess a few questions, how do you choose which markets to focus on? And then how do you position or, or attract those different markets? What's, you know, and, and how do you do that at the same time without seeing like schizophrenic? <laughs> well, so I actually think it's it's one taking one step backwards from that horizontal versus yeah. vertical. It, it's are you um, kind of doing self serve or enterprise? So are you building for an economic buyer? or Are you building for an end user? Are you going to have a paywall that says talk to sales pricing TVD? Or are you going to be like really transparent? And there are trade offs to both. I don't think you can do both of those. That's when you're schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. You're like we're enterprise, but we're self serve. It's like oh, you have to pick one. You really have to pick one. And I think a lot of it has to do with the competencies of the founders. Sometimes for value proposition, you can take either angle. You can do the top down sale or you can do the bottom up. Sometimes you start in one and you merge to the other, like DocuSign started SMB and self-serve and enterprise was like clearly the right angle for them. 
Uh, SurveyMonkey also started SMB. They probably should have gone enterprise sooner. Uh, but then there are things like MailChimp that have never really done that. So you, it, you learn more as you build your company, but where you start kind of dictates if you live or die to get to the next stage. So if you're building for the end user, that typically has to be pretty horizontal to be large enough. Like yeah. it also depends on the buying preferences of whoever you're selling to. So in Doxon's history, we've actually done both. We spent a couple of years just selling up market and sales enablement. And, um, you know, you, you have to look at your CAC, your payback period, and then your, your competitive landscape. And, and so we do have, you know, a lot of public companies that are customers paying us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Um, and, and we love those customers, but we, it kind of doing some soul searching and interviewing a lot of users. There's just a lot of signs that we saw that were like the way we've built Docsend is like just generally usable. It, there's nothing specific about it that says, oh, we only can sell to sales teams. Um, and so we we then looked at that and I did hundreds of user interviews and basically picked out the verticals that we thought we had the best product market fit in. And then we changed up all of our marketing and messaging to have those different tracks up there. And we're still adding more tracks to it. So to some degree, if you're horizontal, you still need to start somewhere. You need to start with some message market fit. Um, and then if that works, you can kind of slowly expand from, from that base. And you see things like Lucid Chart doing that really well, things like Calendly doing that really well. It's it's kind of a new playbook that's only really popped up uh, like since SaaS got cheap enough to build that suddenly you can build these like pretty horizontal things that, that end up spreading pretty quickly. Interesting. Uh, you know, I, I love that. What I'm hearing is horizontal play, and then vertically you go build out. You know, sort of go land, expand. And it's just the messaging. It's not even yeah. the product so yeah. much. But sometimes you can like trade off. We're going to build this now versus that later. Like we still don't have great video support, which we need to add. But for the verticals we've decided to focus on, video support's lower down the list than some of the other items that we added. Cool. So we got a question from our audience. So uh, Rhythm Razwan, what did you do differently versus, I guess, versus those big names that came up and the led to your success? So I guess I think he's referring to like. A Google or any of those other like drop, uh, you know, sorry, uh, box or um, Dropbox or box. Like, so what have you done different to be successful versus your, the big, the big competitors? Well, we're certainly not a Google yet, so I don't think we can <laughs> compare ourselves to them. Uh, well, one of the things we did that was um, smart, but we raised the, just how we raised funding. Like, we raised enough to go make the enterprise bet and. Like our three biggest competitors in sales enablement have raised about 700 million now. So that was a valid thing for us to do. We yeah. just weren't far enough in the lead and hadn't really been building enough of that feature set. So that's like when we took a step back and like in one version of our company, that would have been it, um, you know, because uh, the self-serve wasn't growing fast enough. But then we like took a look back at the self-serve and we're like, actually, there's still something there. Let's see if we can optimize that. And what we did well was just build a good product that people like. So for 17,000 customers, we have four people in support. Wow. It just doesn't break. So, you know, whenever investors are like, oh, build some crazy new thing, and you're like, okay, it's a Hail Mary. We've always been like, nah, just keep keep making the product better. Just make the product better, make it more usable, uh, improve onboarding. And, you know, that that, that has that has served us really, really well. So, um, interesting. And I'm going to go now sound like a, a McKinsey consultant or MBA. So we sort of talk about the value chain you're building, right? You're talking about self-serve, horizontal, low customer support and building a good product. One other aspect seems to be you get a lot of attention through earned media. So tell me about uh, how you've approached that. Like your blog seems to be, you know, is this is this part of your strategy of being self-serve and why do you do so much uh, earned media? So, so, you know, if, if people want, we have a sales team. So if someone wants to talk to the sales team, great. But because we build more for the actual user of our software, that ends up being lots of small deployments often. Um, but then looking at our differentiators, like analytics, like time per page, forward tracking, this model where you can have as many links as you want to and have this like really nuanced security on top of it, like that gives us a certain playbook we can run. And so we're running that first in the like fundraising world. And so, you know, we get our, so we've, I don't know, five, 10,000 founders have used us in the last year for fundraising. And, um, a lot of them will opt in. It's all opt-in research. And then yeah. we pull really interesting insights out of that, right? Because no one knows how to fundraise. Like when I think back to my first time, it was just a very opaque process. So we saw an opportunity to leverage the organic traction we had in that use case to come out with just really interesting data and stories that gives us a lot of earned media around that. And 
So, you know, someone like a box or Dropbox or the, like none of them have that data. They aren't tracking it. They're not that granular. They don't even have that product functionality to be able to run that. So we've got a PR firm that we work with. that's just, they only do data driven PR. Um, and that's just a really good way to stand out, to have like that unique data asset. And we tried other things and, you know, it's just a very noisy world out there. If you're just spending money on demand gen, or again, like if we were going enterprise, we could throw big conferences, Well, not now, but you know, generally speaking, like there's just a different playbook for that. So, so I like that answer. And I'm going to get back to the fundraising st stuff you found after we talk about a bit more about Doxen. Uh, a couple of questions I'm getting from uh, the audience. Uh, I think it's MJ says, what says, when do you think is the right time in a company's life cycle to start on self-serve versus sales team model? So it sounds like you explored both. How did you know which way to go and when, when did you make that decision? <laughs> oh man. Well, so again, keeping track, uh, for our market, like sales enablement, there was a window of time and some companies just went really big for it and we could have done that. Um, but we just looking at our numbers, like you're, so we had a, a like a big S, outbound SDR team, just cold calling and AEs. And so you got to look at your average cost of acquisition and our average cost of acquisition was like, I think $19,000. Wow. And I think our, our average contract size was about that. Um, but pretty lumpy. And so when you look at that math, you're like, okay, we got a multi-year payback period here. Also, there's just a lot, there are a lot of moving pieces and running an outbound sales team like that. And especially for selling big contracts, you don't get as much, like everyone wants something special. And so then you, a lot of companies die this way. And, and so we were like, if that was the only game that we had to play, we could make that work. But because we look at our product and the product is spreading itself to some degree, like let's explore that. That, that is a characteristic just of what we do that is the huge strength. And it's different for every company, right? Depending on what your product does, but but that was the strength of, of Docsend. And so that's why we decided to go double down on that. And did you change the approach to the product at that point? Like, did you reprioritize certain features to make it more viral or to make it easier to, um, to upsell when you decide you weren't, yeah. Yeah, we did. And so we, for instance, saw like we, we tried to put a lot of the features behind like the enterprise talk to us, but then our support team would get questions from people being like, are you the service that does blah, blah, blah. And then we'd be like, yep. And they're like, can I just pay? And they're like, sure. And so, you know, <laughs> we're seeing that enough times you're like, that's, that's weird. Those people shouldn't be going to the enterprise plan. Um, so we basically did enough interviews that we decided to redo our plans of pricing and shoved pretty much all the value into the self-serve plans. Um, cause a lot of our users just didn't want to talk to us. They're like, we know what we need to use you for, and we just want you to let us do that. Um, so, so that, that process, we, we called it uh, project couch change. <laughs> well, and and it, 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 it seems so logical. Someone wants to pay you, I guess, yeah, take it low friction. Um, and in, we, we did have to part ways with some people because we also had people who want to do the enterprise, but this is me thinking as like a CEO and manager. It's really hard if within your company, you have half your company wanting to do enterprise and half your company wanting to just make the product better for the end user because they're, they're kind of different paths. And like Lucidchart is an example, like once you get to certain scale, you can basically build a whole separate set of teams that just go after that other go to market. And it's typically easier to move from self-serve to enterprise than it is to go the other, the other direction, but in order to focus. And so we didn't have debates about what we should be building. Yeah. We did have to part ways with some, some people, but that, and everyone else was really excited and on the same page, which is infinitely easier to manage. And when you made that decision, um, which other stakeholders do you have to involve to get the buy-in? Was it your co-founders? Was it investors? Was it the team? Cause that sounds like a pretty pivotal decision. Yeah, it, it was. So every, everyone was aware of it. Um, and you know, some people felt threatened by it, but we, we kind of slaughtered it in calling it project couch change. We're like running, running this bet. And then when that bet ended up working out, we're like, that, that's it. That's, that's exactly we're what going. we're doing. Yep. That's where we're going. And so for a lot of people are like, Oh, well, this is kind of what we wanted to do all along. Right. <laughs> we're kind of like, well, Kind of, yeah. This is this is at least the DNA of me and my two co-founders. So yeah. So, so that worked out well. Um, another question from our audience, uh, Micah said, "Hey, you mentioned Google, Microsoft should eventually build this. So how do you future-proof yourself against when Microsoft or or Google decide, hey, we're going to add this to our suite of products?" 
Yeah. Well, I mean, take any business. Like, is there ever, is there really a defensible SaaS business? I mean, even something like Facebook with huge network effects is being threatened by, you know, these new channels that are coming out or, you know, it's like you know, Clubhouse or Instagram before or Snapchat or, you know, so even the things that have really strong moats are open to that. And so you just have to be, we have to be one step ahead of them. Like, we understand our space very, very well. And it would be very hard to shove all of the docs and UI into Google Drive. Like if you've used our like spaces or data room products, like how we integrate with mail merge or integrations with like Salesforce, um, just even the link sending model is like really different. Like how we track accounts and tag things and tag people. And um, it would be, there would be a lot there. So uh, I do try to check in though with big companies and be like, so you guys thinking you're gonna go all on this? Um, <laughs> And like, as an example, LinkedIn um, was like, we we're going to build this years ago. And so they bought, uh, no, Point Drive. They bought this yeah. small, small company, Point Drive. And then that didn't really work out. So then they had a whole team that built out smart links. And so, you know, on one hand, it could be like, oh my God, smart links is going to ruin, destroy our company. And it's like, we never hear about them. We, we, have, we have lost zero customers to smart links. And it's great that they have that functionality in LinkedIn, but I think as an entrepreneur, I think you kind of have to assume that you're going to, you have to believe in yourself and you're going to keep executing. Otherwise you'd never start it to begin with. Cool. One more. Oh, one question from a LinkedIn user. For someone who has tons of entrepreneurial ideas in your head, but find starting an entrepreneurial journey a bit overwhelming. What would your advice on starting out? So I guess, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you start out? Well, first I'll say that a lot of people I talk to are experts in something, but if they don't have any ideas there, like everything has been done in my space, you know, but they're experts about it. And then they look over to some other space they don't know a lot about and they're like, oh, I have so many ideas about that space. So things you don't know about can be like really tempting. And so I always urge people to, to try to do something in an area that you know a lot about, like you, cause you're gonna see all the defects. You're gonna see all the things that could go wrong. And, and it can be harder to get yourself excited about that, but you're probably more likely to succeed. Um, and then I will say, if you have a ton of ideas and they fit that framework, just go talk to people. Like just, you know, even if you're an engineer, do the awkward thing of networking, just like, cause you're not gonna learn anything just sitting at home. You gotta get out there and talk to people and talk to competitors too. Just like we did for docs and like, go talk to the companies that you think should be building this. And you might learn a lot. And maybe the best thing you can do is you're like, well, that was a bad one, but you do have to focus on one. And so try to be disciplined about like doing one at a time. Um, cause if you're focused on like 10 things, you're not really focused on anything. <laughs> so I want to ask one more question about the business before I get to actually fundraising. So, uh, we're now in this period where we can't see each other every day in person. So how's your approach been to building a remote team? Um, we've learned a lot of lessons. Everyone's learned a lot of lessons, right? One of the things I didn't anticipate is that when we went remote, we actually found a number of people who just weren't working out anyway and let them go. So we, in some ways became more efficient. And then we've hired back a ton of people since the pandemic started. So I think the majority of our company at this point, we hired, you know, since we, well, close to half, I think we, we haven't met. Um, and it's been remarkably smooth because we are already kind of an asynchronous culture. Like everything is in Asana and Google docs. Um, and so, you know, that, that has made it pretty smooth for understanding swim lanes. And again, like coming back to the example, like if half your company is going after enterprise and has to, uh, going after self-serve, something like that is yeah. probably much harder to resolve being remote. But if everyone is kind of on the same page, it becomes much easier to manage. So my hope is that for a lot of companies, this is just surface problems they should have fixed anyway. Um, and then they can get back to a more efficient spot. But yeah, for, for us, it's it's been investing in our team, making sure people are still making connections, um, keeping community and just being very, very crystal clear about what we want people to do, what's expected of them and, and providing good feedback loops. Um, and not just at six and 12 months, but like all the time and really pushing managers to do that. Another thing I'll note that I find companies often don't do a great job of is like, even Google gets 30% of their hires wrong. And if you get a, a mishire, it's bad for that employee and it's bad for the company. So you, you have to like take time to, figure out who's going to work or not um, and and let let the the make sure you you uh, get rid of your let, let go of your your mishires uh, and those interpersonal like it's that's so much energy like if you've got someone who's not working out and so in a remote world 
that's taking a lot of your energy. That's a real, that's a real problem. So you got to get ahead of those things. So you're a big believer in hire slow, fire fast. You can, you can hire fast, but you also have to fire fast. <laughs> Fair enough. So. I'd like to get into some of the research and some of the data you put out there. So I had a couple of questions about why you do this and how you do this. I think you've answered that already. So I'd like to just start overall. You have all these resources. I guess you've seen all the data on how to fundraise. Uh, you know, what are the most surprising results you found in the, when you guys have analyzed the data and, and published? Uh, Preprint, like overall or like during the pandemic? Overall, just with fundraising. Uh, um, that it's like the three minutes and 30 seconds is the average amount of time an investor spends on a pitch deck. A pitch deck being the document that is shared in order for the investor to decide if they're going to take the meeting or not. Because on the one hand, Three minutes and 30 seconds is not very long at all. You just poured your entire life into creating this pitch deck, this stupid pitch deck, which you can't even use for other things. And because, um, you know, but, but on the other hand, it's a long time. Like it really matters. It, it also is ironic to me that some of the best decks that raise the most have much shorter viewing times. Like our seed deck was like two minutes and 15 seconds on average or something like that. Like, and, and really good decks seem obvious. They're like, oh my God. Yeah, of course. Why isn't this a thing yet? You know, and I do talk, I see index quite often, like a founder will be insecure about what they're doing is it's got a defensible moat or it's complicated enough. And so they, they make things overly complicated in a way that takes away from just the core of what is it you do. Okay. You're a dog walking network. <laughs> That's fine. But don't start with blockchain. Start with, start with that. So great decks just have shorter view time. So more time is not better time necessarily. Uh, but those are those are two of my. my can, I, can I dive in that, that, that into yeah. that? Because I, I was looking at reports, I was like shocked. Three minutes and three seconds. Is that per viewing or overall interactions, or is that that like is just, per that is per view? Yeah, that, that yeah, because that seemed extremely fast. Um, and what are the most common mistakes? I guess other than making more complex that you see you think founders make while putting together decks. Hmm. One of the mistakes is that people get a little too, um, like if their deck's not working, they don't really want to go back to scratch, you know? So don't, don't get overly committed to the way you're pitching your business. You take feedback and iterate. And if your elevator pitch isn't working, then your deck isn't going to work. So you have to be able to describe to people, um, like, what is it that you do? Um, and then I also see some people write a business plan. Like, no, like three minutes and 30 seconds. Like you, people are just flipping through it. Investors are so efficient and looking at decks and they've seen, they see so many thousands a year that, you know, that that's a long time for them. Um, don't include the financials. I think in your pre-seed deck, everyone knows that you're not making money. If the financials are the best thing about your deck, then why are you fundraising? <laughs> um, let's see other things uh, for the pre-seed product is like really critical. So, in the pre-seed decks, the more time spent on product pages correlates to success because we also have a lot of data from decks that failed. However, like seed A and beyond, more time spent in the product pages actually correlates to failure because it should be more <laughs> about like, what is your business? But for yeah. pre-seed, it's like, can you build the thing? Like, I just need to know that you can build the thing and it like might be a good thing to build. So there are like more pages in product and they spend more time on that because investors are trying to see, is this a minimum viable PowerPoint or have you actually built something yet? Uh, and then later on, if more time is spent in the product pages, it's because they're confused. They're like, what is it? What is it that you do here? You know, and then you should shift their focus to like, yes, we have a product. It's working. We have traction. Look at this business opportunity now. So it does really change in the life cycle of, uh, of a company. So I think in the pre-seed analysis you did, I think the, the most, the four best pages, the first pages that were seem to be important were product, team slide, traction, and why now? Do you think, it, do you think someone can raise on just those four pages? Yeah, some people don't need to raise with a deck at all, but that kind of depends on the quality of the founding team. So someone who's had a successful exit before doesn't doesn't need a deck, you know. But so I think we're primarily talking about first time founders, and then there's a big range around like team quality. Like if if you were like the number one data researcher from Google or something, even though you never started a company before, yeah, your deck can be pretty simple. But if you're an unproven team, then you might need to like spell it out and like really work on that narrative that like really draws people to like, like, Oh my God, they've really got something here. And depending on the quality of your team, you might need to have more like products built, you know? So you might need to have more traction. 
Uh, although I will say that investors saying like, oh, you're too early for us. is just the easiest cop out. It could be anything when they say that, like, but sometimes you do need a little bit more traction to, to prove that you're, you're onto something. And one thing I'll just remind uh, founders listening, the three minutes and 30 seconds is they get that meeting, right? This is not mm -hmm. the actual presentation in the meeting. So right. a couple other things in your research, and I want to get a couple of questions I see coming in. So you have this index called the pitch deck in, uh, interest index. Mm -hmm. And you look, I saw three KPIs. It was investor deck interactions, time spent, and founder links created. Why did you use those three to, to uh, sort of see the health of the fundraising right now? Yeah, great question. So go back, rewind to um, you know when the pandemic started. Again, like, no investors are all just like not investing. Everyone's like, oh my god, what? what? And then our question was like, well, what is happening in the fundraising market? And this is all aggregate anonymous data, um, and we have enough share of the market that I think we kind of yeah. know what is the market. <laughs> and and so when we were thinking about it, we're like, well, there, there are really these three key things. Well, one is how how many founders are raising. So this is like how many like links are being cre uh, created. Uh, the next one is like how much time is being spent? Are they actually being viewed? Um, uh, and and so you know th those are like pretty pretty key. Um, and then yeah, so it's like how many founders ending and how many visits are happening? So like how much okay. VC interest? And so there's actually an interesting trade off you can see last year. What happened was that things like everything paused for a while. But then more founders were raising and they were sending more links. And then VCs are not going to conferences. They're not on planes. They're looking through record numbers of decks. Okay. But then interestingly, you've seen like the average time go from three minutes and 30 seconds to three minutes. <laughs> but that's come from, there are a lot of 20 and 30 second views. So VCs basically are just less patient. They're like, they get five pages in they're like, nah. And then they just bounce and never come back. <laughs> so it is as a founder, you're going to have to do more work. You have to send to more VCs, but more VCs are looking than ever before. Uh, but because the view time is down, it puts even more pressure on that asset you send to them in order to get the meeting. And this again, as you said, is, is just the thing you send to get the meeting. And a great meeting, in my opinion, is not you walking through a slide deck. It's like you having a debate with them because they've already yeah. read it, right? So they have questions. They want to try to poke holes in it. Um, yeah, so so this is a great time to fundraise, but it is also a slightly more not annoying time to fundraise. But the market overall has been very efficient. Oh, one more question I got two from the audience, and I want to get to the uh, lightning round. You did a study in the funding divide, and it showed that you know, what we all knew already is that men seem to get more financing than women. What can we do about it? And what do you have any insights that what should be what can be done? And is it simply? Do you think it's is it maybe even doing blind team pages saying just as so and so without us saying their names? Like, any any thoughts or anything um, you've you found about that? Oh, I don't have a crystal ball. I have two yeah. younger sisters. They're both computer scientists as well, and so I mean, I've definitely seen some of that bias, which is just so infuriating for me, right? Yeah. <laughs> so our thought with doing the funding divide research was let's at least take stock of like where we are today. Because you know we we really like to measure things, and we need a baseline. So it you know even if it's the case that you know someone were to say like oh well we already knew that was going on why was the research even worth it? It's like well we we weren't sure to what degree right, and if we aren't sure to what degree we don't know how to change it. Um, my, my hope for this comes from there there being probably a, a knowledge gap not just between like genders but also between geographies. So, you know, like traditionally, it's like, why is it all white men in VC? Well, like that's that's where the knowledge was passed down yeah. from. And so, you know, I often get this from like Canadian companies. They're like, oh, it's so much easier to raise when you're in Silicon Valley. And the answer is like, not, not especially. It kind of comes back to like mentorship and learning from others. It's like, if you're a great founder, I mean, like Mike, who's, uh, you know, from Rewind, like you're, if you're a great founder, like you can build a company anywhere and everyone recognizes that. So to some degree, it's really just a, a skill with pitching and a skill with putting together the information for sure. There is some bias, but I think there, there is a natural market pressure. Like I know a couple, like I know multiple women who have started huge companies and the investors that didn't go with them early on now that they're at the stage where it's just, their business is so strong that it doesn't matter who they are. Yeah. You know, it's like people invest in business metrics, but early on, you know, anyone who didn't invest in them really missed out and their early investors are going to do so well. So just the more great examples like that that we can we can help create. Um, so for anyone who's in a position of privilege or has been through this before, you know, spend some of your time closing that knowledge gap uh, with someone else. 
Well, um, well I, I think you're trying to do with your fundraising network, which we'll get we'll get into with quite maybe Q and A after by like email. But one question from our audience, uh, Daniel, is a great question. Have you considered using your analytics to create an additional value add product or service to founders? If you know, so like you have all this analytics, like hey, three minutes and thirty seconds. Like, can you provide somehow use this to guide founders in any way or add another product? So we, we always kind of like every year or so, or like, what are the crazy things we could do? And, you know, yeah, there, there are a bunch of things we could do, but again, it comes back to the horizontal technology that we market vertically. So our, our marketing team is kind of like separate, like that's working on this stuff. Uh, and so we just have like a team that's doing the startup like stuff. So we, if we, if we tried to like make our product more tailored to it. I don't think so. And, and if we'd launched a new product that we tried to monetize, I think founders are like a tough group to monetize, right? Yeah. Like you're out there, you're trying to get money. So, you know, for us, I view it kind of as a training program. It's like, yeah, use docs and now, and then keep us in mind later. You know, we also do e-signature and data rooms and a bunch of other stuff. Um, so there, there are probably more things we could do there, but I think shining light on like the real thing that we can do specifically to this is just the knowledge or like the learnings around like, how do you create a great pitch? And what's the process for getting in touch with investors and how do you run those meetings? Uh, and then the tracking is is great, um, but the you know what it means for you really depends on you and what's in your deck, and that's something that's kind of on the edge of what we can do programmatically. Cool. Um, now we're gonna go to the lightning round. So let's pretend now we're a VC looking at a dachshund, and we have what what are we putting up there today? Two minutes, two minutes and ten seconds. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of questions. Let's see if we can get through them. Just first thought that comes to <laughs> mind. Some will okay. be easy, some will be harder. Okay, we ready to start? Sure. Okay, uh, when I say Canada, what do you think of? Toronto. Okay, uh, we'll get in trouble with everyone outside of Toronto now. Um, <laughs> uh, what motivates you to go to work every day? Or you? The people. Cool. Harvard or Stanford, which is better? Stanford. Oh, you get, uh, we won't publicize that. We won't get MBAs. Or, well, the <laughs> MBAs are on social media anyway. Um, a a follow-up question. Teach yourself to code or, biz or teach yourself business? So basically... Do you go, do you, which is better, going to school for software engineering or getting your MBA? At early software. So you so go to school for software? Yes, if you're choosing at that okay. early stage. If it's later okay. in life, do whatever you're better at. <laughs> okay, why is hardware hard? It takes forever. It involves too many people. There's physical stuff. I don't, I can't get it in one word. It just, it's just hard. <laughs> okay, favorite font? Figured, you know. Oh, lobster comes to mind, but that's not my favorite one. That's just the no, first font, one font, of. font for decks. Oh, font for decks. I, mean, I don't know, Calibri maybe. Okay, uh, and I'll get you. I was going to ask you favorite food, so we'll go with lobster. Um, favorite activity. No, no, lobster is a font, and we use okay. lobster in our oh. pitch deck for our season. Oh, event. okay, <laughs> interesting. I'm gonna have to look it up. Uh, favorite activity outside of work. Uh, skiing. Yeah. Um, I guess your towel is where are your favorite places to go skiing. <laughs> in my backyard squaw okay cool biggest reason people still send attachments via email inertia uh current company trends you're seeing in your data like do you like i don't know if you can see like the you know the x of uber or the y of airbnbs yeah there have been a lot of marketplaces and there's been a lot of health tech like more, more so than before a lot uh, of health tech is there a fun what do you think is gonna happen 2021 is there gonna be a funding crunch there will be a funding crunch at later stages. Yeah, at later stages. So you're talking like C round, D round? No, no, I'm talking like C to A. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are more ideas getting funded, but. Cool. And then uh, which st which startup do you wish you invested in? Oh, there are too many, too many, to, too many to mention, and it's embarrassing. Okay, I'll give you one more then. A uh, startup you would like to see created. If someone here could start, a, you know, had an idea you wanted to see them test, what would it be? Um, I think that there's just a lot to be done with like APIs and the efficiency. I just look at our team and like how annoying it is to deal with APIs. Like someone's got to make that easier. Okay. So if, if someone wants to do that, we can, you can go create it. You can go test it out, get some traction and we'll get it, get in docs and maybe uh, send it to Russ. <laughs> <laughs> Russ, thanks so much Perfect. for your time today. Hey Russ. Yeah, thank you. Also, hey, I got, I got to ask with, with all that insight that you have, uh, into early stage pitch decks. Like, how do you stay sharp? Do you, are you making like early stage pitch decks on the side? Like just like covertly with like different ideas and different names and trying to raise funding? Like, is that is that how you do it? No, actually what's really fun to me though is I'll read someone else's pitch deck and then I'll give them back like my version of what it would be. And it's more of a verbal thing. 
it's not nitpicking on the deck. I don't care about your fonts. I don't care about the ordering. That can all be fixed. But it's, it's yeah. like the, the narrative has to be good. And those are fun conversations for me. So that's why I do Angel Invest and yeah. you know help other founders. So I think it starts with the narrative and then the details of the deck are you know, things that those are more solvable. Right. And then we make sure it's lobster. <laughs> that's the font. <laughs> I made her pitch deck in on purpose really ugly for our seed round because I'm yeah. like, you're not investing in three designers, <laughs> you're investing in three engineers. And so you just you should know what you're getting here. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks, Russ. That was so cool. Thank you so much. And thanks, Alex, for hosting it. That was awesome. Thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna start a company called lobster.api. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I know my first angel I'm talking to about this. And we'll uh, yeah, exactly. We'll see you back in a few minutes uh, for our next conversation. Uh, that was wicked. What were your takeaways from that conversation? I'd love for you to share them now in the chat. Uh, we can check it out. That way, if someone missed something and you caught it, you can share it there and we can all learn from each other's insights. And while you're sharing those tech takeaways, let's welcome Liz to the stage for a TechTO vibe check. Are you coming up, Liz? Hey, Liz. I have exciting news. What is it? This is the first time I remembered to unmute myself before I added <laughs> myself to the stage. You're all witnessing TechTO history right now. Okay, Amazing. that bodes very well for the vibe check. So how does this work, Liz? So on the side of your screen, you can all see some new emojis just got added. We have some minds blown, some laughing faces, some thinking faces, some stars in our eyes. Oh, I'm already seeing tons of people getting the hang of it. Okay, lots of celebrations, a lot of star eyes. I think people are starstruck by Russ. Maybe some of that advice is really making them dizzy, making them think again about their pitch decks. I know <laughs> someone commented in the chat, they're gonna go back. Maybe it was you, Jason, you gotta go back and restart that deck we started earlier tonight. No, that was Kyle. God. I was Kyle is going to go back and restart. <laughs> and he's doing it right now. He was like, sorry, right guys, now. I got PowerPoint open and then I, and I'm working on it right now. Two screens, dual screens. I'm select, also select all, change font to lobster. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> is about to get a million emails and lobster font. I love it. And that's all coming from the TechTO community. I'm also just going to give you some feedback from the audience. Yeah. Uh, we have someone saying, awesome. Leo's saying, history's being made. John <laughs> says, Russ's data on fundraising confirms everything I know from the ground level perspective. Nothing like some validation to get the night going. Yes. Um, someone was wondering about skiing preferences. So hopefully now everyone knows Russ's backyard yeah. is the place to go. Russ, I hope that means some of us get an invite. <laughs> maybe, maybe he'll let us know. We'll let you know. Maybe a limited number. What of about, us what about this one, Liz? I love this one. Oh, we missed you too, Natalie. Natalie's <laughs> watching with us on Facebook tonight. Um, I Another question came in from LinkedIn, actually, during yeah. the conversation. Jason, I'm wondering if maybe you wanted to take this one. Let's just take sure. a quick, quick look. How do you think 2021 will shape up for tech companies and hiring? Look, uh, we know that it's going to be a K-shaped recovery. What does that mean? It means the economy is doing really well in some parts. That's the top part of the K. It's doing not so hot in the others. That's the bottom part of the K. You know that top part of the K? That is all tech companies. Even Russ mentioned it, they're hiring back their team. They're growing faster than ever. Uh, that means if you are looking for a job or you're looking to grow your career, the tech industry is the place to be. Uh, and it's so easy to get started. This is not something like you had to start your, your uh, 20 years ago studying software engineer. Anyone is welcome, it is accessible, it's open. There's tons of roles. Yes, software development for sure, but there's also biz dev, customer support, marketing, sales, it's all there. Uh, and so it's going to be an amazing, amazing year for hiring. Uh, welcome to the industry. It absolutely is. And if you're watching with us tonight, whether you're in venue or LinkedIn or Facebook, and you think someone needs to hear that message, tell them to come to the next TechTO event. We'll make sure yes. they hear it loud and clear. This is a great community to start with, right, Jason? That's awesome. Great place to start. And I know another pl great place to start the rest of tonight's show is on the wheel of... of Norman. Norman. <laughs> <laughs> right, we gotta work get, on that for next let, time, Jason. Let's get Alex up. I thought that actually went really well. Uh, so let's get Alex up here. Let's get Alex to give a big spin. <laughs> My Alex. daughter is right beside me right now. She's asking what that wheel is. Okay, let her spin it. Let, let's let's you spin it, Rebecca? Come spin it. All right, ready? Oh, you know, here, just go like this. Three, two, one. There you go. Nicely done, Rebecca. All right, let's see what we get here in our next wheel of Norman. Hey, this is perfect. This one's oh, a great Daniel, one about Rebecca. If your kid Daniel or Rebecca was a founder, what would Rebecca's startup be and why? Rebecca, if you do the startup, what would it be? She's now left the room. <laughs> I, 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 okay. Hey, hey, 
Uh, yeah. I think I think she would start up something related to gaming or or, or videoing. That's pretty okay. good. They're okay, there's the, there's the future founders in there right now. Yeah, that they're was, now he's uh, jealous. He wants some attention too. <laughs> uh, Daniel, what would his startup? Be? Daniel, would you if you start a company, what would it be? Okay, it, it, it's evolved the word poo, so I think that's not a problem. All right, all right. I think it's I think it's time, time, to, move time on. to move on. Yeah. All right, let's get let's get another spin in here. Oh, oh one more spin. I love it. What do we got? MJ on venue saying that Rebecca's already exited her business success at a young age. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. What is the most memorable pitch deck you have ever been Doc sent? I love that. We had Russ up here from Doc Send. We want to know what the best deck is you've been Doc sent. Oh, I, I actually think um, the most impressive one I saw recently is Mastermind. By, uh, which is started by Candice Factor and Chris from Chango. It was just, it was like perfect in every which way. The, the look, the story, the narrative, it was just incredible. I'm like, okay, this is a no brainer. I've seen a lot where are more memorable just because I have no clue what they're saying and they use all buzzwords. Like, like I think what Russ said about not using buzzwords is so important. Like, hey, um, you know, I've seen one like, we're blockchain for, we're a crypto blockchain weed company. I'm like, oh, yeah. And then, and what they and they don't need any of those for the company. Like that's so, memorable. Oh, Alex, the one, the 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 mastermind deck. How long do you think you spent on it? One minute, two minutes, three and a half minutes. Probably spent close to one or two minutes because I was already an investor. So, <laughs> so I knew the story, but I was like really impressed. But like again, awesome. There's there's this initial screening and there's actual meeting, which is a completely different thing. We're All right, let's yeah. let's move on with the evening. I'm really excited for our next guest. Yes. So we're gonna we're going to bring our next guest up. I think the perfect segue, a quick question, Alex, if you could rewind time to early 2020, like I'll think January, 2020, before the pandemic hit Canada, what would you do? If you could do one thing, maybe go to a grocery store without a mask, maybe, you know, walk outside holding people's hands. What, what would you do? Actually convince my wife that we shouldn't go to Spain on March 11th, which I had a huge argument about. And, and I, I, and then we had a stressful week in Spain. Sounds like a story for another Tech TO event. Yes. So why don't you intro Mike and we'll get the rewind conversation started. Cool. Um, I'm super excited to have Mike, the CEO of Rewind, joining us now. He just announced their 19 million Series A. Uh, you know, he's no stranger to fundraising and acquisitions. He was a founder and CEO of Add in Social, which was acquired by My Emma in 2012. He's here to share more about his current round and all the lessons he's learned along the way. And I, I think what I love about Mike, and I'm very looking forward to this, he has been all over Twitter since this round was announced, telling the whole story. Like it is a, a story of tenacity to get here today. And I'm looking forward to hearing his lessons from um, from the process. So Mike, please join me on stage. Hey Alex, how's it going? Great. How, are you in Ottawa or are you in some fancy like, you know, like Muskoka and Lake Tahoe? No, I'm in Ottawa. I wish I was in some fancy place near Lake Tahoe. Yeah, so do I. I, I you know, I'm, I'm in Toronto. My, my, I'm lucky I have a view of a city park across the street, so at least nice. I, I can see some greenery. But uh, yeah. you know, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us up on the live stream. So yeah, happy to be here. You know, uh, look, you've this is I think your fourth company and your second startup, and you you were in the first cohort uh, at Extreme Startups in Toronto ten years ago. And you've had some failures along with your current success. So we'd love to learn a bit a bit about what your path and what you've learned. So let's start off. What what did failure teach you? Let's start with the hard question first. What did it teach me? Man, um I I mean it really taught me everything. We you know, in, in running this startup, I, I joke we we took the George Costanza approach to running this business, right? Where if the first one doesn't work out, then you might as well do the opposite in your second one. And so, you know, um, in the first one, we raised money too early. We left our jobs too early. We built a product that people didn't want. We stuck with it for far too long. Um, all of those things we changed um, when doing the second one. I, you know, and, and literally did the opposite. I stayed in my job way too long. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we should have moved much, much faster to going full time on it after we started seeing traction. Um, you know, we, we, I mean, we did raise money, although we waited a longer time to raise money, probably longer than maybe we should have. I mean, just tons of stuff that, 
that really honestly in this in this company I just did the opposite of what I did ten years ago. So so I, I love the idea of George Costanza. You know, I, I was a Seinfeld fan, or I am a Seinfeld fan. It hasn't aged that well, um, but so you have like the lessons from the period where you started your first company. So what do you do now? You're in uncharted territory. So how do you apply that approach now? Because I don't think the last one got the name around. So you're, so how do you like, is, do you actually do the opposite of your natural instinct or is it like, is there some principle in play here? Well, I think now, now it's a funny thing, right? Confidence. Like you develop a com the confidence that what you're working on is the right thing to do, that you know what you're doing. Um, and then as you start to figure out what you should be doing, you, you know, you obviously continue to do more of that. I think the, the biggest lesson really in all of that is just make sure that you're always learning. And so if you're trying new things and those things aren't working, then yeah, you should do the opposite. But as you try new things and those things start working, then continue to do exactly what you're doing. And I think we've, um, you know, we've done a pretty good job, but at staying, on path on executing the the vision that we've got and and building the company that we want cool and and then let's pick apart what you said so you said you talked about quitting your job versus staying in your job and you know i i find that subject interesting because if you talk to most investors like oh you have to quit your job you have to show you're serious so what's what's the truth what's your what's your advice to founders in the room um i think you do have to quit your job in order to show that you're serious i i so i agree with that um I remember talking to, I think it was J.S. Cornway, and he said basically the same thing to me the first time. I think what you have to be um, aware of, at least you know, just talking from my personal feelings, is it's a lot more stressful to be running a startup with no income, um, no personal income, no uh, business income is an exceptionally stressful place to be. And when you're in an exceptionally stressful situation, you, I think you have a harder time thinking straight. I think you have a harder time solving problems. And generally you make your life much more difficult. Um, certainly there are people I think that could handle that. But you know, for me personally, I just found that I was better off running a business and staying in that job as long as possible. Uh, and, and that's what we did. I mean, we still, you know, I worked, um, when we started rewind, we started rewind in June of 2015 and I worked full time during the day, evenings and weekends on rewind for 18 months Wow! before we went full time, like from, from June to February of 2017. That's you know that's a long time. That's that's that was an extremely stressful situation too, running two jobs. Um, but per, so personally, I think you know I do think at some point you have to go full time if you're going to start raising money. But I think you can build a pretty substantial business um, with a full time salary before you raise money, and I think you should be waiting as long as possible before raising. So I want to just understand this in a bit more detail. So you know what in this case, or how do you know it's the right time? Like what's the, you know, what's the confidence, you know, what gave you the confidence in saying this is working? Cause you, cause it could be, is it revenue? Was it tra you know, was the number of customers? And, and then, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, I mean, both of those really for us, um, by the time I left and quit, uh, we were making enough money to support full-time salary for, uh, at that point there were four of us that were working part-time and we could uh, support, um, all four of us on on full-time salaries so certainly that you know that was a really good indication a couple of years before when i was at extreme and and the outcome didn't sort of work out the way i wanted you know i almost ended up um divorced and yeah and um and so i promised my wife i'm like look i'm not gonna like i'm never gonna do this again right and so going three years later, four years later and saying, okay, like now I'm quitting my job. And you know, that thing I told you about like not doing it again. Well, mm, I'm, I'm not going to sort of stick to that. It's a lot easier to have that conversation when it's like, look, I'm working two jobs right now yeah. and I'm basically going to be, you know, back in the family and back contributing as opposed to not seeing you. That was a much easier conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I think we we learned our. I, I personally learned my lesson the first time and tried to sort of switch things up the second time. Yeah, I, I hear you on the wife front. Um, 
And I imagine it sounds like a very stressful period, one where you're not earning income and then one where you have no time for the family because you're doing two jobs. So I am I think you've had the right partner, you have the right, dis- right, the right ability to have discussions. So I'm impressed there because I think that's also, the fa- I, I personally believe in going, but you know, it's, the support network you have as a founder is very important to being able to do what we do. Um, talk about co-founder. Um, you know, what if I, because I think you've been out there and I think your co-founder and you have shown a lot of, you know, let's call it co-founder love recently on, on Twitter. Um, so how do you know you find her? What's the, how do you find the right co-founder and how do you know it's the right fit? I mean, so I certainly feel like, like I lucked out there. Um, I think let's, let's go to maybe the, the implicit question there, which is like, should you even have a co-founder, right? And I've done this twice, once on my own and once with, and I can say without hesitation that it's a lot easier to do it with a co-founder. One of the things we found, you know, really early on before, obviously when we were working part-time and it was just James and I, the two of us working on it, having a co-founder pushes you, right? So when, when he's, um, logging in at night and doing something and then emailing or slacking me the next day and saying, Hey, you know, I just, you know, set up the API call into Shopify to do X. You feel pressure, good pressure to contribute back. And in some way, you know, you don't have to put in equal hours or anything, but you do feel pressure to, to contribute back and you can go back and forth like that. And early on, um, I think it's really tough when you have no customers and you're building towards a vision it's really tough to keep that motivation to, you know, to go and, and work on it instead of watching the hockey game or watching the baseball game or going with your friends to the movies or to the football game or whatever you're going to go. Um, you need that, you need that pressure from a co-founder. And so I think, um, you know, I think having a co-founder, first of all, is, is super important. How do you pick the right one is a is a really good question. I mean, I was lucky because I'd worked with James for about six months before that at a different company. And I just I found I really got along with him. He was really open to the ideas that I had when I was working at that company. Um, he was a sort of great sounding board. He believed in what I was trying to do. And so, you know, it was a couple of years later. And I'm like, you know what? I really enjoyed my time working with him. And let's let's email him and see if he's interested in doing something. And I think from his point of view, he'd probably say the other thing that he was looking for was somebody to to actually execute. So the the important part about both of us was that we were both contributing. Yeah. And I think you can find that out, you know, really early on, obviously, right? If you're working on something and you're the only one that's doing something, it's probably not a great co-founder to have on board. But again, if you get into that, you know, they're pushing you, you're pushing them, and you're both getting something done. Uh, I think that's the dynamic. Um, that you really want. And, you know, we've got a great relationship. I mean, you you can see us on Twitter for sure, but, um, you know, he's he's, uh, the godparent of one of my kids now. So it's just been a fantastic, you know, business relationship, personal relationship. Um, And funny enough, my wife and and his wife actually work together uh, at the hospital here in town. And like, we didn't plan that out. So it's kind of a really great, you know, family friendship that we've built over here. And that's amazing. And I, I hear one tip from your conversation and Russ's conversation. If you are working somewhere else, that co-founder might be there with you if you're lucky enough to have the right colleagues. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's go about, about scaling. And you said you probably took money too long to raise money, but I think you did a couple small rounds in between. Um, and so I guess, why do you think you were too cautious or took too long to raise money? Um, what were you trying to accomplish or why, what, what hesitated you to go go out there and raise a bigger round. We've seen a lot of companies in Ottawa that have raised too much money too quickly and burned through it. And we were very hesitant to not ruin the success that we were getting. We wanted to make sure that the company was at the right stage before raising money, that the culture of what we wanted to build was established. Um, I had a conversation this afternoon with with one of my advisors, uh, Alex Rink, and Alex and I were talking and um, about culture. And I think what's really, what was very fortunate about how we built this company was that waiting so long got us to a level of success uh, and, a, and a quite big level of success where, you know, as we were raising this last round of funding, we were told that the amount of ARR that we'd gotten to on the amount raised was, was literally world-class, that 
like, you know, very few companies had seen that level of efficiency. That really allowed us to, to pick the right partners that we wanted to work with and to make sure that the culture that we've established at Rewind was not going to be compromised by taking money. We're really big believers in working um, eight hour days and making sure our employees work regular normal hours. We're not a startup that uh, is trying to push our employees to work 10 hour days or 12 hour days. We're really big on um, getting your work done in, in eight hours. We think it's more than possible. In fact, we think it's um, that level of work-life balance, which I think is unfortunately rare in startups, we believe has been a, a big factor in our success. And so as we look to raise, we wanted to make sure that we found company, we, we found investors that were aligned with our culture and waiting so long to raise really gave us the freedom to pick who we were going to work with um, and make sure that they, you know, that they weren't going to dictate how we were going to run the business and, um, and that they were okay with things that we believed in. Okay. So there's a lot to unpack in what you said. So I'm going to try to see if I can remember it all. Cause I think that's fascinating. So first let's, let's go back to fundamental. So it sounds like you wanted to pick the right time. So to, to raise, so, was there a specific feeling about the culture? Was it a specific metric? Was it like was it the ability? You know, was it the ability to choose who your investors are? What 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 said this is the time to go raise a? What did what gave you the confidence to do that? Well, so Toby talks about you know at shop, and I'm not trying to compare myself to to Shopify in any way, but um, but Toby does talk about you know the feeling he had that he was holding the business back from its true potential before he went out and raised that Series A, and that's always really stuck with me. Uh, I, I want to make sure that the company is fulfilling its potential. And as we got into last year, into January and February, even before COVID hit, we were having the best um, months we had ever had. So January was the best month we had ever had. We're starting to accelerate our year-over-year -year growth rate. February was better than uh, January. First half of March was better. Second half was uh, a little bit flat. But um, April comes around and we're right back at it you know, May, June, and you really, I, I just really did get the feeling that we were holding the business back. We have a, a competitor in the space, Own Backup, that does backups for just salesforce.com. They, uh, in late in the summer, they raised $50 million um, to do just Salesforce backups. So clearly other people were seeing the vision. They actually just recently announced $150 million raise Wow. Um, at a $1.4 billion valuation doing just backups for Salesforce. So clearly the potential is there. And I think we, you know, we started to see it. Our All of our businesses were doing great. Our Shopify business was doing fantastic. Our QuickBooks business was growing, you know, hundreds of percent year over year. And we just, yeah, we really felt that by not raising money, we were potentially leaving opportunity on the table, with, um, which we didn't want to do. And so, you know, in order to maximize the company for the best, Best thing for the company was for us to raise money, regardless of whether it was best for us personally or not. Cool. And then one more question before, like I think you sound like you were very focused on the culture. So that mean when you're growing the company, was it like product led, sales led, marketing led? Like I, I think going back to, I think call, uh, my experience is cultures reflect on the, on the sort of the organization you build. And so was there a specific way you went to building your organization? Like, you know, and, and overemphasize it to get to the growth you needed to get to, to, to feel comfortable to raise? I hate salespeople. I, <laughs> I do. I just, I don't like talking to salespeople. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I, me building a sales first organization is really not going to happen. I've, I've worked at Adobe uh, on their life cycle product. I've worked at Halogen selling enterprise um, HR software you know, none of that appealed to me. I want a company that sells um, to a lot of people for a very small amount of money on a monthly basis. And so, you know, I think we had built we we built a really self serve product line, right? I mean, yes, there there is some sales aspect to it, and as we move up market, we're certainly um, investing a lot into sales and marketing to grow the business. But the product right from the outset was designed so that people can get started with it without talking to anybody, um, without talking to a human. You can come in, you can sign up, you link your accounts, we start backing them up. Um, you know, Bob's your uncle sort of thing. 
Uh, so I think you know the the culture there was was a, a more product led culture. I think I'd love it to be a bit more product led than what it currently is, and it's sort of on our list of, of, of things to do. Um, but that was that was clearly in place before we raised that last round. Cool. And then you said that you, the VCs told you were, I guess, extremely capital efficient. So like, you know, Series A, again, just ballpark, because I actually got a question from audiences, like, what was the ARR of which you raised? I don't know if you want to disclose it, but ballpark, like, what does capital efficiency of the name mean? Is this like, you know, is it the amount you raise? Is the ARR you were at? So why do they say that? So so it's a combination of, of ARR and what you've raised in the past, right? And so if you look at own backup, um, you know, they've they're somewhere around let's say 30 to 40 million of ARR having raised about 80 or 90. So you know they've raised twice as much as their ARR. Uh, our ratio was four to one the other way. So for every dollar we had raised, we had generated four dollars of ARR. Right, so you know, yeah. somewhere around you know million, you were at four million error, sort of thing, uh, and that level of efficiency is um, well, you would know it's that, that's literally world class to get yeah. to that level of revenue on that much on that little amount raised. That that's really impressive. Even before the current, like even going back a few years, most VCs would say one to one is an, is the ratio you should be targeting. So, right, you're four and times I better. Actually, well, I, you say that, but it's actually I actually look at it. I think I'm starting to look at it like we had we had failed in a way that actually you can be too efficient because what if we had raised that extra money and spent it how much higher would our revenue have been and that's when we started thinking okay that's you know that's a good indication that you you've been too efficient and like you said like a one to one ratio is amazing like it really is like if you can get to you know five million on five million raised that is that is world class and so if you're the other way at you know two to one or three to one or like we were four to one um that's just it's not a it's actually not a good spot to be it shows that you're under investing in the company and there's a lot of uh there's a lot of room that you could have invested in to grow the business further and then one question more question about the raise i want to get back to the company culture and the work-life balance um what are you doing now different than you've raised today? So, you, you know, it sounds like you've done some self-reflection. Um, you've been very capital efficient. So are we going to see you put more fuel in the fire and try to move faster? Like what's, what, 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 what changed today or the month after you close that A round? I, I mean, we're hiring on all fronts. We're hiring sales, we're hiring marketing. Uh, we have a very successful partner program that we're expanding. It's really just doubling down on the programs that we see working, to be honest with you. Um, so we see some good success with our online marketing efforts. Now we've got more funds to run those. Uh, we see more success in our partner. Or we were seeing success in our partner program, especially with Shopify agencies. We're doubling down on that and hiring more account managers, more outbound um, salespeople. We'll, we've bought a company um, that we'll be announcing in a couple of weeks that'll expand us out to a, a fourth platform. Um, Canadian company? So. Uh, no, not a Canadian company. Even better. I want us to be the choirs. That, I, you just made my day. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, not a Canadian company. Um, but, you know, so it's not really that much, it's not really that much different that we're doing. It's just doing it at scale. We're, we're about to launch support for Trello. We're about to launch support for Zendesk. Um, you know, we're planning on expanding the platforms that we're backing up from, you know, Shopify, BigCommerce, QuickBooks to probably eight or nine by the end of the year. Um, so in a way for us, it's a little bit of just rinse and repeat, you know, the same tactics and um, uh, development process that we've used for Shopify and QuickBooks now apply it to other platforms as well, where we have validated that there's a really big need for backups, either because of internal policies or external um, requirements. Cool. And then let's get back to that work-life balance. So, you know... <laughs> People, it's it's very rare to hear people actually focus on. This. So, what you know, tell me why why are you leaning with this? Because, like, I think if you go to Valley, some you know, some companies would say, "Hey, this is a disadvantage for you." So, what, why is it important to you, and what's your belief behind actually having a real balance? Yeah, so I think that's interesting, and I think it's a bit too bad that it seems to be the the opposite way that people are thinking. Um. There's a lot of instances that I can tell you where I've been trying to solve a problem and I just can't get 
the solution. I spend too long thinking about it. I get tired. My brain doesn't work properly. Um, I try a bunch of things. None of them work. None of them work. None of them work. I go home. I have a good night's rest or at least some sleep. And then I come back the next morning and it's solved in 15 minutes. And I venture to guess that most people have a lot of examples that are very similar to that. Software development is not uh, manufacturing. It's creative problem solving. And you need you need a clear head in order to in order to properly work. I actually think that we're successful because we only work eight hours a day. And you know, I, I was at Invest Ottawa for quite a long time. We had our offices there, and I would meet with a bunch of other founders who'd be telling me, you know, I'm not getting anywhere. I'm working ten hour days, twelve hour days, fifteen hour days. And I started thinking, like, well, do you think that that's maybe part of your problem? That if you're constantly like working on it and you can't get out, you can't clear your head, you can't experience something different than work, that you're really not going to be solving the problems that you need to do that. And um, and so we're we're really big believers that you know you can get a full day done in eight hours. That that's more than enough time to do it. It gets uh, it leaves you enough time to um, stop worrying about work or stop thinking about work, focus on something else. I think it ends up with a better family uh, life, better outside work life, which I think is equally important as your as your work life, especially in the long run. Um, does it leave some money on the table? I, I don't know. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but I think at the end of the day, we're you know we're building a company that a lot of people really like working at, and and if you can attract talent and not lose it, and we have a very 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 low attrition rate because people really like working for us, I actually think that's a competitive advantage over companies that are losing you know ten or fifteen percent of their staff um, turning over every year, and so, so we look at it as an actual competitive advantage to the company the way that we're running it. I want to get to a few quick questions, but one more question about this. So what do you have, what happens when you get someone that came from a place that are used to working those long hours and you see some like not, you know, just they come up and you can tell they're working 10, 12 hours. Do you deprogram them or do you let them go at it or how do you encourage them to change? Um, we do, So uh, the way that we phrase it to workers is that it's not, it's not expected of you. Everybody, I think what, what we find these days is that everybody's working different hours. You know, like I'm, I'm talking to you at 8.30. Yeah. There's nights this week where I'll be working at 8.30. But Thursday and Friday when my kids are at homeschool in the afternoon and need help with their math homework, I'm not going to be working from, you know, 1 to 3 p.m. sort of thing. So everybody's working different hours these days. Um, I think it's just it's it's a matter of some people are putting more time in, some people are less. We, we do encourage our employees to make sure that they use their vacation, to make sure that they're not um, working too long, uh, but we give them the flexibility of choosing when those hours happen during the week. The only thing we ask is that they figure out how to fit those 40 hours a week into, you know, into the seven days that they've got, but they're pretty much free to choose when that 40 hours happens. Very cool. I'm going to ask a few quick hits based on some of the stuff. Yeah. So one, um, do you use... It seems like you use Twitter a lot. Any reason why? And um, or at least recently. And I and you know, is, is there is it just fun, or is there any you know, is it is a way to get the word out? Um, I think it's I think it's important. Listen, I think we're really big believers in how we're running this business. I think it's rare. Um, I think we've experienced a lot of things that um, that we hope other people won't experience in running this business. And it's just been a way of, of trying to help share that story and shed some light on what real startup life is like, as opposed to the glamour that comes with, you know, a big fundraising announcement. Um, so actually a question from the audience. Uh, does the growing support for four day work week in some European countries make you th think about doing something similar for re Rewind, and that comes from Klaus. We're, uh, we're actually already ahead of that because we do what's called summer hours. So from May to September, from the May long weekend to September, we take every other Friday off in the summertime. Um, so our, our employees get three-day work, uh, three-day weekends every other weekend. And that's inspired by the team at Basecamp. Very cool. Um, so, yeah, I'd be all, I'm all for a four-day work week for sure. Uh, Three more. I have three more quick questions for you. Uh, are you passionate about curling? I noticed you had a curling startup. 
I am passionate about curling. I started, um, so I was the first one to uh, do live scoring at a national curling championship. So in 1997, uh, when the Olympics were going to be held uh, in Nagano in 1998, I did live scoring for the Canadian Curling Association and uh, at the Canadian Olympic Curling Trials in Brandon, Manitoba. And I ran a popular curling website for a while called inthehack.com. Pretty cool. Um, what learnings have you taken from being a part of the Ottawa tech community? I think it, Ottawa tech community has been always just seems to produce outsized companies. Um, yeah. Like, is there, is there something special going on there? Something you've learned from them? Like, it sounds like, you know, totally there, there's lots of special stuff that happens here, but we don't talk about it with anyone from <laughs> Toronto because we want to make sure that we keep it to, to just the uh, Ottawa area. F fair enough. Um, what, uh, I guess, which Ottawa company other than Shopify, uh, should be on our radar? Um, go for industries. Okay. Yeah. No, no, them. And I'm going to sneak one more in before uh, Liz kicks me off. Uh, what one startup would you like to see in existence other than someone that screens all your, uh, emails and, and <laughs> after, after you raise around, I thought that was a great one. Um, Don't think it's I, a big I with something with the uh, calendaring. I think, um, so I, uh, a long time ago, I launched the Mozilla calendar project. Yeah. And uh, and started that project at my, uh, not my own company, but the first company I worked at, we open sourced our code and gave it to Mozilla and I ran that project. I think there's a lot of really interesting information in your calendar that could be unlocked. And I'd love to see somebody um, tackle that. Mike, I actually may have an introduction for you with a calendar <laughs> company that helps protect time. Um, I was just thinking that, and, and you know what? We can actually build in summer hours right into the calendar. What do you think? Exactly. Yeah, no, that'd be it's, awesome. It's, it's, it's a calendar. It's, it's, it's a team that's actually trying to help you protect your calendar from being overbooked. So. Amazing. Well, look, uh, Mike, thanks, that was Mike. so cool. Thanks for hanging with us, Mike. Uh, thanks for taking some of the extra hours in your day um, that you don't spend working on the business to come and share with the community. Everyone here really appreciates it. Uh, they're loving it in the audience. Lots of great questions and excited to keep the conversations going. Happy to do it. Nice to uh, see Alex. Uh, great to meet you, Jason. And if anybody wants to, if they've got questions, you can find me on Twitter at Mike Potter. And, and if you have a, actually a job site, um, I imagine you do. Maybe we can get yeah, the list. Post it, or what is it? Yeah, rewind.com. Okay, there oh, you go. At new.com. I love it. That is awesome. Yeah. All right. Let's take them down. Thanks for hanging with us. What an amazing uh, what an amazing chat you had, Alex. How you feel? Pretty good. I'm surprised my kids left me, which was a huge victory. <laughs> um, I think Daniel wants to start the poo company, and, and Rebecca's just – Robots. She's, already, she's already exited is what they're saying in the chat, which is great. All right, let's get, let's get a huge round of virtual applause uh, for Alex for leading two amazing conversations tonight. Uh, they're calling him the Alex N, the Gary V of Canadian streaming talent conversations like we're having here tonight. So we are just about to start our breakout sessions. So if you are not yet here in the venue, head over to techto.org, grab your ticket, come on in. It's absolutely free. It is your chance to meet some amazing people in our community, some amazing organizations in our community that are helping you discover how you can meet and learn and grow in 2021. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do about 20 minutes of these sessions. Then we're going to get ready for some one-on-one -on -one connection. So don't go anywhere. Our sessions for tonight are, number one, our friend and TechTO insider, John Blake Nectel is here to share the incredible story of the fundraising round that he recently helped close. If you've been watching the chat inside TechTO's venue, you've been seeing all the tips and tricks that he has been sharing throughout the night, throughout these conversations. Cannot wait to see that story. He's also gonna be answering your questions on your own fundraises and your own growth. He's got advice to offer and he will be there helping you out. Our second breakout session, Liz is going to be hanging out in the content marketing garage with Quinn, talking about everything from Elon Musk on Clubhouse last night to your go to market strategy for 2021. And number three, our friends from the University of Toronto Arts and Science Co-op program here. Hey, Panna, what's going on? Hey, Jason, how are you? I'm good. Tell thanks. us a little bit about what your session is going to be about tonight. Of course. Um, so my name is Panna. I'm with the University of Toronto Scarborough um, from the Arts and Science Co-op team. So I know that we're in February, it's still really cold, but here at U of T Arts and Science, we're already thinking about summer. So if you have a need for co-op students for the summer, come over to our booth. Uh, we've got students in computer science, uh, math, stats, and more. 
Our students can go out for four, eight, or 12 months. So there's lots of flexibilities. And we understand that it can be difficult to hire on a student right now. So uh, there are a lot of government wage subsidies out there right now that can help out up to $7,000. So stop by and learn more. Unreal. Get those summer students for those summer hours. Thanks, Panna. We'll see you out in the breakout sessions. Uh, so here is how it's going to work. Uh, if you are on LinkedIn or Facebook right now, you got to go to techto.org, click on the live streams button, get inside our venue. Then I am going to disappear. You are going to see a button for each of the breakout sessions. Simply click the one you'd like to join. Feel free to check them all out by clicking the Explore More Breakout Sessions button in the top right. And try to make an effort to visit every room tonight. You never know what connection can change your career, can change your life. Enjoy the sessions, and I'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Are you ready? Set? Here we go. All right. If you are not yet in the venue, you definitely, definitely.